minute, okay. So we are live now and we can go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Shama, may I? Yes, ma'am, please. Okay, uh, good afternoon, one and all. Uh, welcome to the next session on International Teaching Month on the theme of labor law. And uh, we have with us Professor Dr. Elmari Susan Fowry, Professor of Law at University of Johannesburg, South Africa. And she would today be discussing and speaking on the topic, Women in Informal Sector, Labor and Social Security Perspectives. And now I would like to invite uh, Shreya Ma'am to please welcome Ma'am on behalf of Institute of Law, Nirma University. Thank you so much, Anamuti Ma'am. Uh, I take great honor to welcome Professor Almarie Fori, who's a senior lecturer and head of Department of Public Law at University of Johannesburg, South Africa. I am thoroughly pleased to welcome you virtually to ILNU, and I thank you for accepting our invitation, though it was on a short notice. Uh, but, but we are truly honored to host you, and we hope that in the near future, we are able to meet at our campuses and also take forward the MOUs that we have between U University of Johannesburg and ILNU and see the, both, both the universities thrive under the L uh, IL, uh, MOU. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. And with that, I would request Anubhuti ma'am to go ahead with the formal introductions and then we can begin with our session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. So uh, before we can proceed with the session, just a brief introduction of our esteemed speaker for this session today. So today we have with us Professor Dr. Elmari Susan Fowry. Ma'am completed her BPROC degree in the year 1994 and an advanced diploma in labor law at Rao in 2002. In 2005, the LLM degree in labor law was conferred upon ma'am by University of Johannesburg, South Africa. She was also awarded the Chancellor's Medal in the year 2006 for the best master's degree student in the Faculty of Law and the South African Society for Labor Law Prize for the student with the best results in the LLM degree in labor law. Ma'am has joined the Center for International and Comparative Labor and Security Security, so, uh, social security law as the coordinator of the center. In 2006, she joined the Department of Mercantile Law and has taken lectures in labor law during the year 2006 and 2007. Currently, Ma'am is the senior lecturer, head of the Department of Public Law and the program coordinator for the LLM in labor law and also gives lectures on different themes and topics of labor law to the undergraduate students at University of Johannesburg. Ma'am was also awarded a Vice Chancellor's Distinguished Award for Teaching Excellence in the year 2010. Ma'am has al also been a part of various task committees which prepare legal opinions to be given to the government departments and drafting legislations for the South African development community countries. She also completed her doctoral thesis in the year 2018, which was titled Finding Innovative Solutions to Extended Labor Law and Social Protection to Vulnerable Women Workers in the Informal Sector. And ma'am also has numerous publications in national and international journals to her name. And she has also presented papers at more than 35 national and international conferences. Ma'am, on behalf of Institute of Law, Nirma University, we welcome you again. Before we can proceed with this session today, I have a few protocols for the audience. I request all of you to please switch on your cameras during this session. Also, please put your microphone on mute mode when the session goes on. Thirdly, the session will be followed by a question answer session. So please send me your questions privately through the chat box. And now I would like to invite Professor Elmari Susan Fowry to take over the session. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, let me start by saying I'm honored and it's a privilege to take part in this International Teaching Month. Um, India has been one of the countries that I've studied and I'm very interested in the work that is done. So really I'm honored to be here today. Um, my presentation today 
uh, deals with labor and social protection of vulnerable workers in the informal um, economy, specifically looking at certain groups and the South African perspective. I just want to see my slides doesn't want to move. Okay, so I think to start, uh, I have to explain my conceptual framework of this paper. And I have to start with perhaps looking at what do I mean when I talk about the informal economy? Now, firstly, I think the best definition for us in South Africa around the informal economy is the definition that we find in the ILO recommendation 204 of 2015. It's a very wide definition, and I'll explain later on why I prefer to work with this definition. It says all economic activities by workers and economic units that are in law and practice not covered or insufficiently covered by formal arrangements. So here it clearly states to us it's possible that workers can be covered by formal arrangements, but in practice, they still exclude it. And that is the position with some of the groups in South Africa. So I think that is a very interesting definition. It also excludes illicit activities. I'm not going to discuss illegal activities. We don't categorize that as the informal economy. Oh, I, know, I know many European countries do, but that is excluded. Uh, the notion of social protection is also wider than social security. And in 2002, the Taylor Commission said that social security is a very narrow concept for developing countries or countries in Africa. Because when we talk about social security, we are saying that there's an employment relationship. And many workers are excluded then from this notion. So we prefer talking about social protection this is a system of social support that is not linked to employment, but to general welfare and support. And I think this is very important for women workers in the informal economy, that we look at a holistic and an integrated approach. In South Africa, if you do not comply with the definition of an employee, you are excluded from most labor laws. Our definition of um, an employee talks about any person excluding an independent contractor who works for another or the state or is entitled to receive remuneration or receive remuneration. And the second part is a little bit wider. It talks about a person assisting or conducting the business of the employer. So we see that it's quite a narrow definition and most informal workers in South Africa fall outside the scope and therefore are not covered by labor laws. This definition we can see throughout our labor laws and also our social security um, uh, legislation. And then I think just some background or an overview, we know that in recent times employment as well as its fundamental design purpose and coverage have changed. And it's changed extensively to many, to the detriment of many non-standard workers. We know that non-standard workers is increasing. We know that new forms of work have emerged. And then we go back to labor law because labor law was often drafted to only protect employees in the traditional full-time employment paradigm. And therefore, as labor laws stand at the moment, it is inadequate to provide protection to workers in forms of non-standard employment. And here we can even include platform workers. For us, Uber drivers are excluded. They don't enjoy protection. It is not, it is because they do not fall within the traditional full-time uh, employment paradigm. Um, we know now that uh, informal employment is not going to go away. The ILO has recognized that by adopting the ILO recommendation. We know it's a reality and there's a growing acknowledgement of its existence and its pervasiveness. In South Africa, now categorized as a middle income country, as well as other developing countries, Informal economy workers do not enjoy sufficient protection. The informal economy in South Africa is lower than other developing countries in Southern Africa or even in the Southern African development communities. However, these workers are also characterized by various degrees of vulnerabilities. We know that the ILO said that more than 70% of workers across the world are without protection or without adequate protection. And we know that in many developing countries, the informal economy is not the exception, 
but the norm. Now, I specifically want to look at the vulnerability of women in the informal economy. And if we look at this uh, draft or this table, we see that men in the informal economy are predominantly employers or regular wage workers. They receive higher wages and they have lower poverty risks. Women in the informal economy are more often casual workers, home workers, or unpaid family workers, and they receive irregular wages. So what can we say about women in informal economy? Women are more disadvantaged due to the market relationship within the informal economy, but also as members of groups defined by race, class, and ethnicity, and as women due to gender norms in society and because they're often involved in unrecognized or undervalued work. The nature of their work often, relax, of, often relax, results in a lack of a worker identity, as their work is merely seen as their everyday duties. Feminization of poverty and gender discrimination mean that female workers are amongst the most vulnerable in the informal economy. What are the challenges? lack of labor and social protection, various levels of poverty. They often represent a previously disadvantaged group, and this contributes to lack of skills, lower educational levels, gender inequalities, lack of empowerment due to patriarchal societies, low and irregular wages, poor work conditions, and very importantly, a lack of representation at various various levels in the informal economy. So I want to look at actually three groups of informal economy workers in South Africa, and I'll explain the question mark behind domestic workers just now. The groups that I want, con want to consider are waste pickers, street vendors, and domestic workers. I do not focus on home workers in this presentation, because often if they work for someone, they should fall within the scope of an employee. When we look at waste pickers, what are they? They are actually one of the most vulnerable groups, specifically the women in the informal economy. They collect, sort, recycle, and sell materials, waste materials. Why are they vulnerable? Because their place of employment pose many dangers. It is streets, dumping sites, landfill sites, uh, and they're often also just referred to as garbage pick pickers. Similar to India, Waste pickers in South Africa mostly form cooperatives. Um, the, work, uh, the work that they do save both in India and South Africa, the country lots of money with reference to waste management. However, these workers remain marginalized, unrecognized, and undervalued and are one of the most vulnerable groups. The challenges, the dangers of their workplace, the dangers of the toxic materials that they might encounter. Also, they depend on the weather. If the weather is not good, they cannot work. So labor and social protection, very problematic because there's no discernible employer. And what we saw with COVID in South Africa under lockdown level five, they could not work at all. They were not contributing to unemployment insurance because they were not employees. So they had nowhere to go without any funding. They depended on civil society to bring them food. Later on, the uh, president, Cyril Ramaphosa, introduced a grant of 350 to help workers who are unemployed and have no other income. But 350 is not even a living wage in any, in any way. Um, Let's talk about domestic workers and then I'll go back to street work, um, vendors. Domestic workers in South Africa are in a different position. They are covered by labor laws in theory, but in practice, the enforcement of these workers are extremely problematic. And I am going to discuss a constitutional court judgment around domestic workers. What are the challenges? Well, their workplace is a private home. And of course, that poses many challenges. The nature of their work is innate. Interesting enough, in South Africa, for example, domestic workers leave their own children behind with a grandmother to come into the home of the employer to care for the children of the employer. And this 
child care work is completely underestimated. Another interesting thing is the value of domestic work. By coming into the workplace of the employer, they allow the female employer to enter the labor market. So it's literally a position of the female employer standing on the shoulders of the domestic worker to contribute to the labor market. But we faced numerous challenges in South Africa with reference to enforcement. Perhaps I can just highlight Domestic workers are employees, so the employer must contribute a percentage to the unemployment insurance fund, and the domestic worker contributes a percentage. Uh, but because we don't have enough labor inspectors and we don't have enough trained labor inspectors that can go to the households to check, when COVID-19 and the lockdown regulations started, and these workers was, should be able to claim from unemployment insurance, we realized that only 20% of domestic workers' employers in South Africa contributed to the fund. And only 15% could actually access the fund due to numerous challenges. So I'm arguing, although they are covered by labor laws in South Africa, if I go back to the recommendations definition, they are not sufficiently covered in practice due to the lack of enforcement. So still very vulnerable. I must also mention that all three groups, waste pickers, street vendors, and domestic workers represent previously disadvantaged black women in South Africa. So they are a particularly vulnerable group. If I look at at, at, at street vendors, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, street traders account for more than 51% of women that are active in the informal economy, and this is excluding agriculture. It's a wide concept. It includes vendors at a market. It includes vendors at a stall or vendors um, on a street corner. And of course, they sell a variety of goods. Um, we also find here that women are particularly vulnerable. Why? Because mostly they will operate from a mobile stand, unlike men who will have a permanent marketplace. But they also add value to countries because they play an important role in promoting uh, food security and providing services at a lower cost to members of the public. The Supreme Court in India in Singh versus Delhi, if I'm correct with the pronunciations, said that if street vendors are properly regulated, they can considerably add to the comfort and the convenience of the general public by making available certain articles at a lesser price. In South Africa, what challenges do they face? And I'm sure it's very similar in India. In fact, I know police abuse, harassment from authorities, local authorities harass them continuously, a lack of a permanent workplace, illegal evictions and illegal confiscation of their goods. And I will also later on consider two const one constitutional and one high court judgment in South Africa where the courts came to the rescue in instances of illegal evictions. Let's look at the framework in South Africa. In South Africa, the constitution is the supreme law of the country. So that means that all laws must comply with the constitution. And if a law does not comply, it can be declared invalid or inconsistent. You cannot directly rely on the constitution if there's another uh, piece of legislation that regulates the matter. Your cause of action will be to test the legislation against the constitution. We then, then have the wonderful values of human dignity, equality, and freedom. Human dignity as in India played a very important role in the protection of informal economy workers because it's also a right. And we are saying that if you don't enjoy decent work conditions, your human dignity is impaired. And the courts have actually stated that. Then, ladies and gentlemen, in our constitution, it says that when the courts interpret the law, they must consider international law. That will mean all the binding, all the binding and non-binding uh, ILO instruments will be considered in any court or by any court in South Africa. Our constitution in chapter two has a bill of rights uh, where we find our human rights. Interesting for labor, there are two specific rights. In section 23, we have the labor law rights that starts with a wide concept. Everyone has a right to fair labor practices. And then it moves to the term worker. 
Our labor laws, on the other hand, talks about employee. And we also have in section 27 of our constitution, the right to have access to social security, including social assistance. But of course, that depends on the progressive realization by the state with reference to resources. So we find a limitation. And then, ladies and gentlemen, of course, there are other human rights. I've already mentioned the right to human dignity, the right to equality, the right to choose your occupation, the right to just administrative action, the right to freedom of association. And because these are human rights, they can come to the rescue to provide remedies for some of these informal economy workers. The Constitution Supreme and our Constitutional Court is our apex court. And then if we look at the labor laws in South Africa, we have the Labor Relations Act. All these legislative uh, pieces have the same definition of employee. Labor re relations regulates dismissals and unfair labor practices and strikes and collective bargaining. Uh, but if you are not an employee, you're excluded. The Basic Conditions of Employment Act provide a minimum floor of rights, such as hours of leave, overtime, maternity leave, sick leave, and so forth. Once, if you're not an employee, none of those rights are applicable to you. The Employment Equity Act pro prohibits discrimination and promotes equality. But also, if you're not an employee, you cannot even claim sexual harassment under this act. Unemployment Insurance Act deals with unemployment insurance. Occupation Health and Safety regulates the safety in the workplace. And the Compensation for Occupational Injuries and Diseases Act provides compensation when there was a workplace injury, illness, or a death. And I'm going to come back to that act. It is famously known as COIDA in South Africa. Of course, informal economy workers pose many challenges to trade unions to organize. And in South Africa, we find that the unions do not have the political will because it's difficult to organize these workers. They're not in the traditional employment relationship. Uh, they have a lack of resources. They don't know how to organize. How do you organize domestic workers in the private place of employment when you cannot access the private place of employment? Many and often the workplace is remote. And it's widespread, and I know that often happens in India. And the workplace is mobile. Mobile. I have a stall here today, and then I move. So to get these workers together to organize is extremely difficult for the trade unions in South Africa. So what do we need? We need innovative solutions. We need new strategies. Tailor-made benefits. In other words, we have to find a way to collect membership fees and to give them certain benefits that they require. I'm arguing that to organize workers in the informal economy, you'll have to recognize the, the, the diversity and the requirements for different needs. And then you need innovative communication methods. I know in India, they would find a church where all the domestic workers could meet or a park, and there they will organize them. So you won't have your classic workplace organization. You'll have to find an innovative way to organize. And then lastly, I'm also saying we must move away from the traditional concept of trade unions. They are not always the appropriate vehicle to organize, and specifically women in the informal economy. In South Africa, because trade unions are still very male orientated. Other organizations like cooperatives, member-based organizations, um, NGOs and so forth can help in the organization of these women. I want to discuss three, three cases uh, with reference to the categories that I've discussed to show you, although they fall outside the scope of labor law, they have found some protection. And two cases on the Constitutional Court, one in the High Court, but human rights played a very important role in the extension of protection, as well as the right to human dignity. In the Makwikane case, and this case deals with street traders, we had a 60-year-old informal trader. He was the sole breadwinner of his family. He was responsible for eight dependents, and his goods were confiscated um, by public authorities. 
and he challenged the Business Act that provided for the confiscation and the empowerment against the Constitution. So he challenged the bylaws and the Business Act, and he said these provisions in legislation is unconstitutional, and there's no limit to the fine. The authorities have unfettered discretion to provide any fine on these street traders. The acts and the bylaw also did not provide for adequate procedures for the removal of the goods and the empowerment. These sections provided authorities with unfettered discretion. It allows for the removal of goods and the suspension of rights without any discretion. Um, and this removal and empowerment actually affects the livelihood of these traders because they can't work then they can't earn a living um and we must also i must also mention here that these street traders once again represent 90 percent of them represent a previous disadvantaged group and the courts took these legislative provisions and the courts measured them against the constitution and they looked at section 9 the right to equality section 25 that regulates property rights and section 34 that provides for access to courts and the court said this must change because every day that this street trader is in court he also loses his livelihood and this contributes to their prejudice and their vulnerability and the court said that any administrative action like this must be lawful and it must be reasonably and procedurally fair. So what did we have? We had a group of already poverty-stricken socioeconomic class that challenged the validity of the laws and the practices. And we actually found that the Constitutional Court found these bylaws and legislation to be unconstitutional and that they must be they must be changed this is a landmark decision and we immediately thereafter saw that municipalities incorporated different bylaws uh, and the Bi business act challenged this and to amend this according to the the constitutional um, court judgment and then a very famous case, this is a constitutional court judgment, and I think it's an excellent written judgment. I also always say to my students, I think I will take some of the things that were said here and tattoo it on my arm to always remind me how valuable our constitutional court can be. But what the court said, and this also deals with uh, street traders that were removed from their trading location by the city of Johannesburg, and the mayor called this the clean sweep. The problem with the removal was that street traders that had permits and street traders that did not have in, any permits were all removed so even if you were trading legally they removed you and they impounded your goods so the city did not distinguish between legal traders or illegal traders and the court said something very interesting about the powers of people in authority and the court said when women and men in government disregard their the law, their conduct may well, well cause much hardship, particularly for the vulnerable amongst us. And isn't that true? Um, how this could impact on the poor people who are already suffering a number of disadvantages. Um, so we found here as well arbitrary enforcement, uh, and it was not fair, just or. Um, uh, uh, procedurally fair. What I must highlight here, and this is very important, I'm sorry, uh, what the court said here, that when you took away their ability to earn money, you actually impacted on their human dignity. You actually impacted on their human dignity. And very important, and if you look at this paragraph, I'll go through it now, what did our constitutional court do? It highlighted the interrelationship between fundamental rights, and it showed us that these rights are mutually reinforceable and interdependent. So we have the right to freedom to trade, the right to human dignity, and also the right of children. Um, and I think in, there's a, is it Hector Hawker's union case in India, where the court also equate the actions of public authorities when they overstep their boundaries as an impairment of human dignity. And just look at this beautiful paragraph. The court said, it must be added that the eviction of traders involved constitutional issues. 
the ability of people to earn money and support themselves and their families is an important part of dignity. When they cannot do that, they face humiliation and degradation. Most of these traders on the market had dependents. Many of these dependents are children and they suffered hardships as the city denied the breadwinners lawful entitlement to conduct their business. The city did not dispute this. Um, the city's conduct had a direct bearing on the rights of children. Look at this. Rights to basic nutrition, shelter, and basic health care. And the harm that the traders were facing was immediate and irreversible. What a beautiful example of how our constitutional court can come to the rescue and extend protections to vulnerable workers. The last case, ladies and gentlemen, before I conclude, is a recent case. It was a landmark decision last year, November, uh, from our Apex Constitutional Court. In the beginning, I told you domestic workers represent a previously disadvantaged group, and I also told you that they are covered in theory. But domestic workers in South Africa could never claim from COIDA, the Compensation Fund for Injuries and Diseases, until November 2020. They were excluded from this. This means that if a domestic worker got injured at the job, she had to use a common law remedy and approach the high court. She doesn't have the money, it's extremely expensive. And then she must prove negligence, which is also very difficult. So when a domestic worker got injured at work, she basically didn't get anything at all and would have to fall back on the social assistance system. Now, what happened in this case, we had a very old lady domestic worker. She was 60 years old and she was, uh, her sight was severely impaired. She was standing on a ladder washing windows and she fell into the employer's pool and she drowned. And the employer merely said, well, I didn't even hear anything, so I don't know what you want me to do. And her daughter said, but where must I claim now? And she took the case to the High Court and then to the Constitutional Court to say that the exclusion of domestic workers in this case is discrimination. And it's actually direct and indirect discrimination because domestic workers in South Africa are 90% black women from previously disadvantaged groups. And the courts found this is intersectional discrimination. They are discriminated because of gender, race, and so forth. And this is unconstitutional. If a domestic worker does not enjoy decent work, that impairs her human dignity. And this is not in line with our constitution. So a very interesting order. The bill, the, the COIDA, the act was found to be unconstitutional. And the minister is currently drafting a bill to include domestic workers. However, enforcement will be extremely problematic because employers are not allowed to deduct this from domestic workers' salary. And if we don't have labor inspectors to go around, how are we going to make sure that they, um, that they actually contribute to this? So although the judgment extends protection, in practice, I foresee many challenges. And this judgment says it's retrospective from 1994. So can you imagine the large amount of claims that we will now see against the fund? I think that is fair. That should have been rectified then already. But of course, procedurally, that is going to be a nightmare. Then I must just highlight, we have domestic workers that work um, 24 hours in a month for various employers. If you work 24 hours or less, you are not an employee. So that you may have a domestic worker that work five, five times a month for five different employee employers, but it's not 24 hours. So she will be excluded. She will still be very vulnerable to any injury that can occur at the place of employment. Concluding remarks. I think it's of the utmost importance that we find in a way, innovative ways to extend labor and social protection to workers and women workers in the informal economy. I do believe that there are times when we can extend existing prov provisions, but I would promote adoption of tailor-made provisions because the workers are so diverse. I would promote representation of women on all levels. When you look at a street trader or a waste picker, if they cannot negotiate with public authorities, 
they cannot gain. So we need representation of women on all these levels. I propose an integrated approach to ensure gender equality. They must be treated differently because they are vulnerable to obtain substantive equality. When we look at extension of protection, we have to see this as a whole, as an integrated approach. So you have to consider the social, economic, and cultural considerations when you address systemic inequalities. I very strongly believe that labor law must be responsive to the needs of these workers. And then the struggle of one woman is the struggle of all. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, ma'am. Ma'am, we have a few questions for you. Yes. Shall I stop sharing or? Yes, ma'am. So uh, we have a few questions for you. Uh, the first question is from one of our faculty colleagues, and he also teaches labor law in our institute. So the question what he has asked is, women wage worker in informal sector are largely invisible and in reality outside the purview of the mandate social security law so what is the mechanism which we should follow so that they can get major benefits especially during the time when they uh, seek maternity benefit can i can i answer that yes ma'am Okay, that's a, that's a very good question. I actually think that our unemployment insurance fund um, at the moment only caters for employees and employers. Now that was changed. Um, there must be a category of workers that are excluded, which have the option to at least contribute to that. And the, the system must be changed to make provision for irregular contributions because they receive irregular wages. And the fund must also make provision for those who are self-employed. So I really believe we need to look at our, in South Africa, at our unemployment insurance fund, where we have a fund where workers who are outside the scope of social security protection can contribute. And then when you have such a category, you have to realize the diversity. You must realize that one month they might be able to contribute and the next month not. So you'll have to be able to assist them with that. Of course, in South Africa, we also have a social assistance system. Now the social assistance system is means tested. And though it doesn't cover a worker during maternity leave, once the, 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 the worker um, um, has a baby, she will be able to claim for a child support grant. I also strongly believe this is where, where trade unions, networks, and cooperatives come in. To, specifically, if you look at street traders, when that woman, uh, 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 she doesn't even take maternity leave because she has to work. If she doesn't work, she cannot, uh, um, she cannot earn. So she continuously works. And then when she has the baby, there's a time period that she cannot come to, this, to the mall. Or, and there we need to help. But that we need to, to have women representation. We need to consider changes to our unemployment insurance fund. And I think that was highlighted in South Africa during COVID, because what we did is we established a different fund, and the um, um, President Ramaphosa then uh, looked at a 350 rand, very small amount, to all people who do not qualify anyone else. Another possibility for us is a basic income grant, and we are seriously considering that to at least help that worker during that time. But I strongly believe we need innovative and tailor-made overalls looking at our unemployment insurance fund. We must move away from the narrow conceptual framework. We must be flexible and we must provide for tailor-made solutions. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, we have another question for you. And the question is again from another faculty colleague of ours who is teaching at Institute of Law. The question is that we have literature which reflects that liberalization of the economy has led to the increase in the number of workers and laborers in the informal sector. So how should we balance the economy and the social security so th uh, for women workers across the globe? That's a very difficult uh, uh, question. Um, in South Africa, because of our extreme inequalities and poverty, liberalization of the labor market is very problematic. Uh, you know, our workers only enjoy protection since 1994. So 
once again, I don't know if that is the solution for us in South Africa. I rather think, and I think what has happened with COVID-19, for the first time, our government has realized the plight of women in the informal economy. And once again, I think we must find different ways. I don't think if it's liberalization, I rather think we must take what is there and see what existing measures can be extended and what do we need to create? What innovative and tailor-made solutions do I have? I know that in India, um, and I didn't specifically focus on the BD workers, but with the BD workers, if I recall correctly, and please you're welcome to correct me, they pay a certain amount, a tax, uh, a export tax or a tax, and that money is used to assist them. So we are sort of, sort of saying, let's look at street traders. Let's even look at waste pickers. When they save governments millions, can't there be a certain amount that's allocated to them for a fund? Let's look at street traders. In South Africa, many of these street traders sell um, our African art to tourists. Can't we put a levy on that and create a fund? Uh, so, you know, we need to think outside of the box to help these people and create funds that perhaps are not strictly linked to the traditional social security system of employer and employee. Thank you so much, ma'am. Ma'am, we have another question for you. Yes. I'm listening. Can I think there's a bit of lag at her end. We'll just okay. wait for a minute, ma'am. Can I maybe say something while we're yes, waiting? Yes, yes, please, ma'am. I'm, I'm, I'm very interested because my, my, my doctoral thesis was comparative to certain issues on India and Brazil. So afterwards, if any colleagues are interested in any projects that we can do together as part of our collaboration agreement, we're already meeting, I think, with someone at your university next week about certain things on social justice and legal yes. education. Please, we must stay in contact. I think this is a wonderful project and I would really like to collaborate um, and to expose some of my masters and doctoral students who are also working on this topic to all your expertise in India. Definitely, ma'am. This is, this is an op offer that we would not want to refuse. Okay. And I think uh, that uh, a joint collaboration is very essential. Uh, research really uh, is what we require at this moment. So we'll certainly work on it. I will just uh, get in touch with uh, Anubhuti ma'am and okay. uh, we'll, we'll carry forward. Hello. Mujhe question bhej do mein pada deti huh. Questions are you going to ask? So, uh, Anubhuti ma'am is just joining. There was some power lag. Okay. Uh, she's just joining back. Okay. Perfect. But it was a wonderful presentation, ma'am. And uh, if I may read out the third question to you, okay. that uh, the role of legislature and the employer is equally important for regulating and uh, implementing the things uh, truly. But in your opinion, in reality, whose role is more significant with respect to the informal sector between the legislature and the employer? 
Um, I absolutely think the legislator, the employer has no interest in South Africa if there's an employer. Often there's no clear employer in the informal economy. But if, let's take domestic workers. That employer has no interest to, to pay more or to, to do anything to provide protection. So the employer in South Africa is certainly not interested. So it is definitely the legislator. And we've seen that with domestic workers because what did the legislator do? The legislator issued a sectorial determination, identifying domestic workers as a vulnerable group, and then including them in labor legislation. We also see now with occupational health and safety or the compensation fund, the employer doesn't want to pay extra. The employer is not interested if the employee gets injured. However, once the constitutional judgment was handed out, the legislator must now amend the bill. So I, my viewpoint is that let's just say the majority of employers in South Africa do not have the political or the social will to regulate or extend protection. And often it is cheap labor for them. So I really hope, and I've listened to a number of speeches from our government officials during COVID. I think COVID highlighted their vulnerabilities. And I really, really strongly hope that we will see more action from the legislator. The second thing is what, 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 what would you want the legislator to do? I don't merely want the legislator to extend provision. I want the legislator to bring about innovative and tailor-made solutions. If you look at the domestic worker, for example, we have organizational rights. A trade union has a right to have access to the workplace and have a right to information. But with domestic workers, they can't access the private place of employment, so that's excluded from laws, and they can't have access to the private banking account of the employer. So, and, and even if you look at the relationship, the residence is often also, the place of employment is also often the residence. So I wonder, is, are tailor-made solutions not better than merely just extend existing provisions that were designed for people in full-time traditional employment. Right. Thank you so much, ma'am, for that, for that answer. And we have another question from a student of ours. Yes. And uh, they want you to highlight upon the statutory protection, which is provided to construction workers under the South African jurisdiction. Okay, that's a little bit outside my scope, so I, I can't provide you with a full answer. I have never done research. All I know that our construction workers have a, 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 a sector, so that they, the terms and conditions are mostly regulated by a bargaining council. So terms and conditions come from sectorial level, um, but of course, often there are a large number of informal economy workers, um, and most of them are male, and in South Africa, uh, the employer to escape uh, labor laws call them independent contractors. So how this will work, we have, because we have more than 30% of people are unemployed, more than 11 million people, you'll find these construction workers who are not permanently employed on corners of streets. And the employer will come with a bucky or a vehicle and they will pick them up for the day. So they are just day laborers and they have no protection whatsoever um, unless they are full time employed when they enjoy the bargaining council agreement. So certainly a very, very vulnerable group. Um, a day, we call them day laborers. They are also mostly previously disadvantaged workers. But of course, they don't have. So there's an injury on the construction site. They will have no access to compensation. But to claim from the employer. Um, no protection against dismissal, but in most instances they are day workers and they are often categorized as independent contractors, which means they are not bound by any laws, which is a very sad situation. True, true. And ma'am, we have a very interesting uh, comment by one of our faculty and he also wants you to opine upon it. Uh, yeah, Dr. Anand Shinde, he asks, he says that Mahatma Gandhi spent nearly 25, 21 years in Johannesburg. And uh, what are the contributions by him that you find are reflected in the South African law, especially with respect to social justice and the topic that we are discussing today? Well, thank you for that. Wonderful. I, I, I must tell you that we have a wonderful constitution. If you take our past and you take our constitution, um, 
It is amazing constitution. And as I illustrated today, our constitutional court has actually changed the lives of people. Uh, it's actually brought food to people. And, and uh, I think the issues that were highlighted during this and contributed with reference to, to social justice. Social justice is an objective in nearly all of our labor laws. And then if you look at us, the specific contribution, I think when we look at you, the importance of human dignity, the importance of equality, and then the notion of substantive equality. Uh, that, is, that is, South Africa needs that notion and that was brought here. And substantive equality in our constitution means means that certain people must be treated differently because they come from previously disadvantaged groups. And I think that notion and the transformative nature of the constitution, but most importantly, I think our founding values of equality, freedom, and human dignity. And I think the notion of embracing our very diverse society. Um, I actually get goosebumps. I, I, I think it's amazing. These, these, the notion of human dignity, which was not, which was not at all applicable during apartheid um, for a long time. So that brought forward, how do we get social justice in communities? We award people human dignity. We look at substantive equality. Whatever laws we must have, must have a transformative nature. We need to change our society. And I think that is extremely valuable. Sure, ma'am. And we have one last question that uh, we would request you to answer. <laughs> so with respect to the role of trade unions in the informal uh, sector and in light of gender equality, do you think that there should be any mandatory provision in the trade union committee that there have to be women members in the committee to ensure gender equality? Absolutely. Absolutely. South Africa, you must remember that in South Africa, trade unions come from a political fight. During apartheid, they didn't fight for labor rights. They fought for equality. And then all of a sudden, they got all these labor rights. Now you must know they must do a mind shift now. We're not fighting for a new government. We're fighting for the rights of workers. And then you must remember trade unions prior to apartheid were mostly men. So it's a very patriarchal society. And I highlighted to you that in South Africa, trade unions are very reluctant to organize workers in the informal economy because it's challenging. Um, the, the, women's, the women trade unions that we have did not succeed. Uh, and maybe it is because of these patriarchal issues. Um, so very, very problematic, but I definitely believe we need to look and say, look, if you want to register as a trade union with the Department of Labor, let's see in your constitution, how many women workers are members of your board. I think that will allow, that will do many things, empowerment, it will give women a voice. And I think that is of the utmost importance. Then issues like maternity and childcare will be negotiated at a trade union level. I must just mention, and this is a very interesting concept that we're currently working on. You know, Labor Relations Act. We, we have bargaining councils. That is when trade unions and employers organizations come together at sectorial level. And I've discovered during my research, no one picked this up, but in the act, it says that bargaining councils have a duty to help workers in the informal economy with things like pension and social security systems. So we're now promoting that and say, okay, come trade union, it's not a political fight. We're fighting for the rights of workers and I'm fighting for the rights of women workers in South Africa. We want you to look at this clause in the LRA. You must do something about this. You can't just sit back and only look at those informal employment. We need you to do something to help the workers that are not included in legislation. Thank you so much, ma'am, for that answer. And I have a small follow-up question. <laughs> so, uh, and, and I hope I'm not taking too much of the time of the audience mm -hmm. and yours. So we have got to read about how the labor sector has become a place of modern slavery. And uh, there have been so many instances of exploitation of women and uh, the notion of modern slavery being attributed to the idea of the current labor uh, informal sector. So what steps is the South African government uh, taking to protect these, uh, the, the, these particular vulnerable groups? 
So, so if we talk about modern slavery, I suppose let's go back to domestic workers because I think they come from a classic history where in America and wherever that was the, 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 the notion of, of their employment. And I think that is why in South Africa we included them in labor legislation. Um, so they are covered. Um, um, so we have extended protection to them to say it's a formal employer employment relationship. It means you are covered against unfair dismissal. You are covered against unfair labor practice uh, and you can join a trade union. Also, it also provides them with minimum hours of work, leave, pay, uh, pay for overtime. And with the domestic workers um, a convention and recommendation, you have seen we've signed that, ratified that there are certain conditions that must be met. They must live, if they live on the premises, they must at least have a window and access to water and they must have time off. So providing minimum terms and conditions with things like leave and time off, I think you move away from slavery. However, once again, if you can't enforce it, there are many domestic workers that work under terrible circumstances. For example, migrant workers, we hear stories in India as well, where passports are being locked up in a safe and they can't move anywhere. But when you have laws that regulate minimum terms and conditions, protection against unfair discrimination, protection against unfair dismissal, I think you're starting to move away from that. And then we have an employment equity Act that says uh, you're not allowed to discriminate against any worker and it also says harassment um, is a form of discrimination and interestingly enough we amended the Employment Equity Act to say that if you are a low income earner which most domestic workers mm -hmm. and many vulnerable workers are you earn less than 204,000 rand per annum when you have a case of harassment, you can go to the CCMA and that's free, where normally you had to go to the labor court. So what do we do? We protect them with reference to legislative provisions, and then we make access to courts easier so that when there's an issue, we can provide them with access to justice. Thank you so much, ma'am, for that in insightful <sighs> answer. And I would now request our student representative, Mr. Naman Sharma, to officially propose the vote of thanks for this uh, wonderfully thorough and thoughtful lecture. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. A very good afternoon to one and all. At the outset, I'd like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to Professor Elmari Fauri, ma'am, for taking out time and providing us with insights into a very important and important social and legal issue in the present times. It was indeed an enriching experience, ma'am, and the insights into the legal perspective shall certainly be fruitful for all of us. Thank you so much, ma'am. I'd Thank also you. like our Dean and Director, Professor Dr. Puvi Pokhreal, ma'am, for giving us all the opportunity to be the part of such enlightening session. Thank you, ma'am. Further, I also extend my heartfelt gratitude to the technical support team for providing us such a realistic experience in these tough times. At last, I would like to thank all the participants for being an active and patient audience. Thank you everyone for joining. Have a great day. Thank you. May I just say thank you for the opportunity. I found it very engaging and I'm looking forward to collaboration uh, and the road forward. Thank you, much appreciated. I hope you all stay safe and good luck with everything. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was a pleasure meeting you virtually and hopefully we'll meet soon physically on the campus. I hope Thank so. You. Keep well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Bye. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Thank you.